um, so we can continue now. Uh, we'll yeah, begin by addressing uh, you know, uh, Brother Kennedy's questions. Um, so the first question is, uh, when is a believer's security wholly and completely in Christ's hands? Uh, now, um, if you're thinking in terms of eternal security, then um, we will see the entire complete realization of that only, of course, when we get to heaven. Um, because while we are on this earth, there will still be trials and difficulties the way Jesus said. You know, he said, on this earth, you will have trouble, he said. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So we will be exposed to trials. There will be persecution. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, uh, yeah, in, in fact, you know, we, we may get hit by infections. You know, we may, we, we may get sick. So we, there is still exposure to so many things which are negative while we are still living in this fallen world. So um, if we are thinking about security in human terms, you know, regarding human things like, you know, disease and uh, financial, um, you know, difficulties and things like that. Uh, yes, God does allow us to be hit by those things, you know, uh, during certain seasons of life. Um, but uh, we are secure in Christ in the sense that uh, he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. So we know that he will help us. He will you know, bring us through all of those trials and difficulties as long as we hold on to him. So when it comes to spiritual uh, security, yes, we are secure in Christ in the sense uh, you know, our eternal future has already been guaranteed. And uh, But at the earthly level, uh, we don't enjoy total security in that sense because uh, we are still exposed to the trials and difficulties that are there on this earth. So when is a believer's security wholly in Christ's hands? Uh, when we get to heaven, then we will experience security in every sense, in the sense that nothing can even come and touch us. There can be no pain, no sorrow, no difficulties, no nothing. Uh, total security. But here on earth, we are still entirely, most definitely secure in Christ. Um, it's just that we will go through difficulties, but even in the middle of those difficulties, he will still be there because that's the promise that he made in John. So he says, you know, you are the, the, while you're on this earth, there will be trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And he, in fact, he says, you know, I'm, I'm, be, I'm telling you these things that you may have peace in me. So even though we are in, we go through hardships and difficulties, we know that we are secure in him because he will work things out for us. And like, you know, it says in Romans uh, 8, 28. So even though we are going through difficulties and hardships, we know that in all things, the Lord works together for our good. So even in, in the midst of all of those things, he takes all of those circumstances and works them out for our good. Um, and then coming to another aspect of security, uh, when we take a stand and we say, no, I will not lie, I will not deceive. Uh, then there are some times when God immediately miraculously comes through for us. And, you know, even though we spoke the truth, uh, you know, nothing bad happens. In fact, things work out most beautifully. On the other hand, there are many instances where you take a stand for the truth. And because you have done that, uh, you really get it. Uh, you know, people really, you know, um, get you into all kinds of trouble. And... Um, and then, you know, the devil may say, oh, see, if you had told a lie, you could have escaped from all of this trouble. But you continue to stay secure in Christ and say, no, I took, I took a stand for righteousness. I chose to please and honor my God. And I chose not to be deceptive. So yes, it's true that many, many extra troubles have come upon my head because I chose righteousness. But I am secure in Christ. Because, you know, he will ultimately work things out for my good. Yes, the immediate results have been rather negative because I took a stand for what is true. Now I'm in greater trouble. So um, in that sense, you know, you didn't, get, you didn't get immediate results. But down the line, your future is indeed secure. And we have this amazing, you know, um, 
passage in Jeremiah chapter 17. Um, if we were to start looking from verse 5 onwards, so Jeremiah chapter 17, uh, verse 5 onwards, and uh, you know, this line of thought goes on, goes on right up to verse 8. So Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8. In the first portion, you know, verses 5 and 6, it talks about a person who does not place their trust in God. Uh, and so it says over there in Jeremiah 17, verse 5, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. Because they think that by turning away from the Lord and by living this earth life, you know, living the way the rest of the people are living, they think that by living in that way, they can secure their future and have security in their life. But actually what happens, they end up like one shrub in the desert, okay, um, uh, with almost no, uh, no, no future, no sustenance, nothing. On the other hand, it goes on to say in verses 7 and 8, a person on the other hand who chooses to trust in the Lord, you know, they take a stand for what is right, even if, even if it's going to mean negative circumstances, even if it's going to mean, you know, negative uh, results. Uh, why? Because it says, when the heat comes, it shall not fear. And then it says, in the year of drought, it is not anxious. Because even though, you know, uh, now the entire... Um, uh, everyone is now against them because they have taken a stand for the truth and now people are working against them and and painful things are being done to them no problem the heat is coming the drought is there but in the midst of it all it says they will flourish they will bear fruit their leaves will continue to stay green because the god who is upholding them he will never let them down so in that sense even though they have taken a stand for what is good and because of that, they have suffered. Um, they will stay secure in God. God will secure their future. So actually, when this question was asked, I don't know in what sense you know you um, were thinking when you when you talked about a believer's security being holy in Christ's hands. But yeah, at, at different levels, in different ways, we are secure in Christ's hands. Eternally, yes, once we go to heaven. That will be there in all in all it in all its completion. We will experience and enjoy that security. But here on this earth, there will be negative things. There are times when God will work out things for us immediately, and we will enjoy the fruit of having followed Him. There are other times when the fruit will be delayed. In the sense, He will allow us to go through the persecution. We will go through hardships because we took a stand for the right. But ultimately, even though there is heat. Even though there is drought, like it says over here, you know, in Jeremiah 17, uh, 7 and 8, that tree will continue to have green leaves. That tree will continue to bear fruit. Why? Because it is secure in its in Christ. You know, God will take care of the of the life of that particular person. Uh, so that's regarding security. Um, coming to the other uh, uh, question about clarification for Colossians 3, uh, verse 4. Now, um, I'm not particularly sure, uh, you know, uh, what you are looking for in this particular verse. Um, it says, when Christ who is in your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Um, it's talking about the end, uh, end time, you know, the second coming of Christ. Because when he comes, we will be revealed with him in glory. Um, not exactly sure what the question is. Um, because right now, in the eyes of the world, we look the way they, they look. I mean, we all look the same. Um, and we all go through the you know, almost the same trials and all of that. Uh, so, but that day we will be revealed. It will be revealed to everyone that oh my, this person's life was hidden in Christ, because on that day uh, we will become like Christ uh, in the sense we will receive resurrected bodies like Him and we'll be made into His image. So that revelation of who we are will be revealed to everyone on that day. But right now it's a hidden thing. It's something that we live out in faith with Christ on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's like kind of connected to the previous verse, verses 3 and 4 go together. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
and when Christ who is in your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So right now it's just a, it's more a hidden thing. People can't see that. People can't really see the advantages for, of, you know, of, of the life that you're living out. They'll think, why is this person being so foolish? Why are they sacrificing themselves each day? Why are they crucifying their desires? What's wrong with them? They don't understand that we are hidden with Christ, that we are, you know, waiting for eternal rewards, that we are thinking long term and not just, you know, adjusting with um, with temporary uh, things. So they don't understand our, our lifestyle now. Sometimes they see us being blessed by God and then, then they, they sit up and, you know, they pay attention and say, wow, this person is getting really blessed. So what's going on in their life? Who is their God? Wow, why are they so different? But there are there are times when you will not get visibly blessed. You know, you just keep going through a lot of persecution and difficulty. And at that time, people will not be able to see and understand that there's something amazing happening on the inside. But everything gets revealed when he comes back because he will reveal himself in all his glory as the Lord of Lords. And he will, you know, he will uh, he will he will show the world that he was always the conqueror, that he was always the victor. They might have been thinking that, you know, um, Christ is some, somebody who died on the cross. But he will reveal himself as the conqueror and victor that he is. And we will be revealed in him as conquerors and victors who actually held on, you know, held on up to the end. And now we are going to uh, uh, reap the, uh, the rich reward of having held on to him in faith. Um, so that's maybe one way of looking at uh, Colossians uh, 3, 3 to 4. Uh, but then if you had something else in mind when you ask the question, uh, you know, you can yeah go ahead and, you know, uh, express those things. Okay, fine. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. So um, we kind of came up to verse um, 10 and uh, moving into verse 11. Uh, again, verse 11 has got something really uh, good. Um, yeah, if someone can read out verse 11. Verse 11. Here there is not Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Cycatian, psych slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of, you know, a little slow. We are behind schedule. But it's okay. I mean, we'll we'll catch up uh, uh, because I mean uh, this is this is a good point that can be made over here in verse eleven. You know about this new life that we have in Christ. Um, so it's it's a new way of looking at ourselves, and it, and, and I think it is important. Um, so here it says uh, there is no Jew or Gentile anymore. You know, there's no longer any barbarian or Scythian or a slave or a free person, but Christ is all and is in all um so uh, if you're you know uh, if you're restricted to the earth life you know and if, if and if that's all the life that you have you know just like all the other people then um you will label people the way everyone else goes around labeling people and you will also accept the labels which they are sticking on you because that's all that's the way life operates you know um, you're either the top dog or you're the underdog and you just got to accept it. But now something has happened. Now you have a new identity. Your life is hidden in Christ, right? So now you have an entirely new identity. So there are new labels. The way you label people also changes. And the, and the labels which you accept for yourself also changes. So over here, you know, I mean, how would uh, the, these people, believers you know in Colosse, how would they have understood this it says here there is here there is no gentile or jew so you know they are all they all go to their church service they all gather in the house church for their you know uh, church service and you have the the jewish believer he looks at the gentile believer sitting over there on the opposite side of the room and he thinks in his mind oh you know i mean if, if he still has the old way of thinking he would say to himself ah I am circumcised. I am more holy. That poor chap, what to do? He came from a you know heathen background. He's not circumcised. He's not as good as me, not as holy as me. It's probably how the Jewish believer would look at the Gentile believer. The Gentile believer, on the other hand, you know, is maybe let us say he's a slave owner. 
So he looks at his slave and he thinks, ah, this slave, he I spent a lot of money to buy this guy. Now, how can I extract some more work out of him? You know, after making such a heavy investment, I should get my money's worth, right? So how much more can I extract from this guy? And then uh, the believer who's uh, the, the slave who's sitting over there, he's also a believer now. And in his mind, he's thinking, I'm not like the Jewish believers. They are circumcised. They are the people of God. I'm not like the slave owner, you know, my, 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 my Gentile owner. He's a rich man. He's self-sufficient. I don't have any status. I am not circumcised. I'm not even a free person. I'm just a slave. Oh, and my status is so low. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. That would be the way these three people are sitting and thinking over there, you know, in that church service, in that house church. On the other hand, if they start understanding that Christ is all and is in all, when they start grasping this truth, the way they look at each other completely changes and the way they look at themselves completely changes. So when a person realizes that Christ is all and is in all, this Jewish believer looks at the Gentile believer sitting across from him and he thinks, my goodness, when I was a baby, I was just you know, circumcised by human hands. This Gentile person sitting there next to me, he has been not been circumcised with human hands. He's been divinely circumcised by Christ himself and the entire old self was put off, circumcised and cut off. And he is now a new creation. I better treat this man with respect and give him the dignity that he deserves because he is a new creation circumcised by Christ himself divinely, not by human hands. So the way he looks at his fellow Gentile you know, uh, brother, completely changes. The Gentile who is sitting over there, he does not look at his slave and think, oh my, what can I extract out of this guy? Rather, he thinks, now I have a heavenly master. I better treat my slave in a way that will please my heavenly master, you know, because I'm now responsible and accountable to him. And this man, the slave who's sitting over there, he's now my brother in Christ. I can't just treat him like a like property. He is a living person and he he now is a son of God. So I can't just go around treating him the way I any 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 which way I would like to. So he he the way he looks at his slave changes. And the way the slave believer, you know, the believer who's a slave who's sitting over there, the way he looks at himself is now completely different. He thinks, yes, it's true. These people, these Jewish people have a rich heritage. I don't have that. Um the Gentile, or my Gentile owner who is rich, he's really wealthy, you know, in in um, in earthly terms. But you know what? I have Christ in me now. My life is hidden in Christ. So I'm actually as rich as them. My Christ will provide for me all that I require. And so he no longer sees himself as this helpless person who can be crushed by anyone and everyone and exploited. He understands his new identity in Christ and he starts relying more and more upon Jesus. And Jesus starts releasing into him all the benefits and blessings that I know that a believer is meant to have in Christ. So everything about their identity changes because Christ is all and is in all now. And that completely changes our identity and who uh, we are and what we can have, you know, in God. Okay, so um, then verse 12 onwards, he goes on to talk about the way we should live, you know, as believers. Uh, so maybe we can just, you know, read at one go uh, verses 12 to 16, because these are all, you know, things that we have talked about earlier. Verses 12 to 16, if someone can just quickly read out. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And of overall, these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace, 
and be thankful. Uh, verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Yes. So uh, it talks about now, now because we have understood our new status, now that we have understood that we are no longer tied to the old earthly practices, we can now operate in freedom uh, because of the perfect law that has been given to us in Christ. You know, we can operate at a higher level. So we choose because we understand these things. Now we choose to live in this new way, in this more difficult way, because it's not easy. All the things that are being talked about over here are things that we can only do through Christ. If we stay hidden in Christ, if we, if we, if we, uh, you know, uh, draw our sense, uh, 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 draw our strength, uh, and if we draw our, uh, you know, anointing from Him, He enables us. He equips us to clothe ourselves with compassion. He is the one who helps us to forgive if a grievance has been done against us. He is the one who helps us to live in gratitude. You know, the three times it's mentioned in verse, verse 15, it says, you know, uh, and be thankful. And then in verse 16, it says, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And then in verse 17, it's, it, it says, whatever you do, whether in word or de deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So whatever we may be going through, positive situations, negative situations, in all of those situations, in our words and in our deeds, we live with an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude. Why? Because we realize that we are that safe and secure in Him. Yes, there are going to be trials. Yes, when we stand up for righteousness, rather than being appreciated, probably we know we will end up with a whole lot of new hardships. Uh, but we endure all of that because um, we know that we are safe in Christ. The heat will come, the drought will come, but our leaves will continue to be green. We will continue to bear fruit because we have, you know, we are trusting in Christ. So all of that, you know, it exp So if I am not living in a very thankful manner, if I'm not singing with gratitude in my heart to God, um, if I'm not giving thanks to God the Father, you know, in, in all that I'm doing, it means that I have still not yet grasped who I am. Because once I realize who I am, and once I realize the security that I have in Him, I will be grateful. I will be able to rest and just thank Him and say, yes, Lord. I don't have to be anxious about anything because that's basically what Philippians uh, six, um, actually, Philippians four, you know, talks about, right? It talks about how we don't need to be anxious about anything, but in everything we can just bring our petitions to Him with thanksgiving because we know He will take care of it all. So we can have, we can, you know, live in a new way once we are secure and understand what our new identity is. Okay, uh, then uh, verse 18 onwards, uh, we come to a, law, a whole bunch of instructions, which are almost very, very similar to our Ephesians 5. So if you were to look at Ephesians 5, uh, I think it was like verses 20 onwards or something. And then if you look at the verses over here, it's like almost you no know, uh, repetition. It's almost the same thing. Uh, so if we can, uh, if someone can just read out for us, um, uh, verses 18, to maybe 21, yeah, 18 to 21. Wives, submit to your husband as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything that this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bound servants, obey in everything your sword your earthly masters, not by way of your high service, as people pleasers, but with sincere of hearts, fearing the Lord only. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these are all things that we have already talked about when we were doing Ephesians 5. Um, 
just to touch upon just some you know some some uh, some basic things uh, so we will not go into detail but at least to look at some things um uh, you know so this is almost a parallel of what we have already seen in Ephesians 5. So it says over here in verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. OK, that's the term that is used over there. The Greek phrase that is so used over there actually is, you know, it is your it is fitting for you to do this. It's your obligation to the Lord to do this. So even if the husband is a harsh person, why does this wife continue to submit to that harsh husband? Because this is her divine obligation to the Lord. She is obliged to do this because she has now chosen to uh, you know, come under Christ's lordship. And she has now, and because now she is hidden, her life is now hidden with Christ. This is this is something that she must do on a daily basis. It is it is it is fitting. It is an obligation that she has towards her Lord and Master that she must continue to submit to this husband. And uh, but she can have the assurance that God will take care of her and her needs and her future. Uh, because you know, if we were to very quickly go to First Peter chapter five verses five to nine over there, it's talking about. Uh, submission to authority in a different context. Okay, if First Peter five five to nine over there, it's not talking about the marriage relationship. It's not talking about uh, husbands and wives. It's talking about leadership and authority in the church context. And over there, you know, the people uh, are asked to submit to the elders. And uh, over there, you know, in First Peter five verse. Um, Five, it says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And then it says over there in First Peter chapter five, verse six. If someone um, could read out verse six and seven, yeah, First Peter five, six and seven. Humble yourselves, faithfully, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Casting all anxieties on him because he cares for you. Yeah. He's sober minded. Huh. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Eight and nine. Yeah. Why did she stop? Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, crowds around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Devour. Resist him for a new faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Yeah. Now you see this entire passage is talking about leadership in the church, submission in the church. Uh, but the same uh, divine principles that are you know mentioned over here, the same divine principles of submission and authority can actually be applied even in the marriage context. So over here, they, you know, the, the, these people are being told, submit to your elders. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And so this lady who is living in this marriage where this husband is very, very harsh, she continues to fulfill her divine obligation towards the Lord you know, in submitting to her husband. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. And so what does she do? She humbles herself under God's mighty hand. She's not just, you know, um, uh, giving in to the harshness of, of a human, you know, to the human, uh, to the harshness of the human husband. She's actually humbling herself under God's mighty hand because this beautiful mighty hand of God will lift her up one day when the time comes. Because you see, she is so faithful towards him. She is honoring her Lord by, by humbling herself under his mighty hand and being submissive to this harsh husband. Because she is living in this honorable manner and she's humbling herself under the mighty hand of God, the mighty hand of God will lift her up one day. You know, when, when the time comes, he will take care of her. So what does she do? She casts all her anxiety upon the Lord because the Lord cares for her. He knows what she is going through in that marriage. And that is why, you know, she chooses to trust in God. Since the devil is roaming around like a hungry lion, he wants her to grow bitter. He wants her to grow uncooperative. He wants her to lash out. 
but she you know stands firm in the faith and she resists satan and she does not allow herself to be deceived and because she is choosing to humble herself under god's mighty hand god will lift her up when the time comes so you know the principles of submission and, uh, and authority which are discussed over here in the first peter 5 passage it can even be applied in the marriage context um, so wives must submit to their husbands because it is an obligation to the lord and then uh, the husbands are told not to be harsh towards their wives but to be loving towards them and um, then of course you have the uh, the verses for about the you know fathers and children we've already talked about that you know when we were looking at Ephesians and then uh, there are the instructions about the slaves so they're not going to you know pretend that they are working very hard when the when the master is watching and then get lazy when the master is not watching rather they'll continue to work in all sincerity because they are serving their heavenly master the Lord Jesus and they know that one day the reward will be they, they'll receive a reward from him even if the earthly master does not appreciate their efforts, they'll continue to work hard because they know that there is an inheritance which they will receive from their, uh, from their Lord. Uh, so all that is discussed in verses 22, 23, 24, verse 24, where it says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So even though uh, humanly, they may just be slaves, and you know, in our uh, present day context, we may just be mere employees in the organization and the superiors don't really care about what happens to us. But our Lord, for whom we are working, we are inheritances in him and he you know, will take care of us. And that is why it says in um, yeah, verse 25 and maybe the first verse of the next chapter, if someone could you know, read out verse 25 uh, of chapter 3, and also verse 1 of chapter 4. We really don't have much time left. If someone could please read out the last verse of chapter 3 and the first verse of chapter 4. For the wrong verses. Go ahead, Sadie. Go ahead, Asha. Thank you. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants just justly and fairly, knowing that you have also a master in heaven. Okay, so here it's talking about how uh, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs. So the Lord will, you know, do justice for us. So if this, you know, if the slave is not being treated right, the slave is not being treated fairly. There is a master in heaven, you know, who will take care of these things. So we can have this deep assurance, you know, and security in in Christ. Okay, so then after that, uh, in, in this chapter 4, verse 2 onwards, um, it talks about four kinds of prayer. So if someone could quickly read out for us verses 2, 3, and 4. Verse 2 to 4, it reads, Continue earnestly in prayer, be vigilant in it, with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, verses 2, 3, and 4 are talking about prayer. And there are four different kinds of prayers that are you know talked about here the first is devote yourselves to prayer being watchful you know that brings to our minds that uh, matthew 26 uh, you know uh, verse you know in, in matthew 26 41 it says watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak so over here in your colossians 4 
two when it says devote yourselves to prayer being watchful that's basically what it's talking about temptations will come hardships will come they will hit at a time when you least expect it so you should have been praying beforehand already preparing yourself and getting yourself ready for what's going to come because when you spend time in prayer the lord will you know um, strengthen you in your mind he will strengthen you in your feelings in your emotions he will build you up in your inner person he will start doing all of these things for you when you pray regarding this and say lord prepare me help me to be more like you enable your realities to become so real to me that i will see that rather than what the world sees you know when the, when the time of temptation hits uh, because they can only see the immediate situation but you on the other hand i have been prepared by god so you will be able to look at the spiritual realities you will be able to respond in a in a higher superior way so all of these things will happen only if you have been watchful in prayer watching out for what's going to happen in the future and preparing yourself beforehand for it in prayer because in your spirit it's very true you are willing but remember in the flesh you're just a human you have human restrictions so you need to um, you know build yourself up through prayer the second thing it says you devote yourself to prayer being watchful and thankful so it should be an attitude of thankfulness each time i pray i must pray with an attitude of thankfulness really knowing that god will take care of my need he may not answer in exactly the way i wanted my prayer answered but he will take care of my need he will provide me with what i require for my life so we can have this deep assurance and and you know pray to him with thankfulness knowing that he will do he will do uh, whatever we are asking for um uh, verse three it says uh, pray for us too that god may open a door so the third kind of prayer is that we pray that doors will be opened up for ministry you know because there are some places where the people are so hostile to the gospel that it looks like it's impossible for anyone to go and share the gospel over there but we are supposed to pray that god will open the doors the doors which are closed god will open them up so that someone can go over there and minister and share the gospel or it may just be a you know a, a place where people are so indifferent they're so busy with their everyday life that they could not care less about spiritual matters so in a, in a, in a hard place like that where people are just apathetic to spiritual realities we pray that god will open the door that he will open the door into people's lives where they will be willing to listen to what is being shared about the gospel so it happens only through prayer the closed door the sealed doors which you know it looks like as if nobody can penetrate through prayer those doors get opened so that people can go and you know uh, share the gospel over there the fourth prayer point point that he asks for pray that i may proclaim it clearly so that we should pray for the people who are sharing the gospel um and that you know we will be able to do it in a way that um that we will be able to share the gospel in a way that is very clear and meaningful so that you know uh, the people who are listening to this word which we are preaching to this gospel which we are preaching they will be uh, uh, where where is the thing in uh, colossians you know in 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 colossians chapter 1 verse 5 you know it says that epaphras you know he he preached the true message of the gospel and because he preached the true message of the gospel it led to this eternal hope they became excited about eternal things rather than temporary things and that caused them to live in faith and love so the we should pray that people will be able to preach in that kind of a, a manner you know fully explaining and presenting the gospel in the correct way so these are the four kinds of prayers that we are you know urged to pray um and then verses 5 and 6 uh, uh, which actually i think were already read out uh, are talking about something else uh, how do we what should be our attitude towards the people of the world the unbelievers you know as far as ministry is concerned as far as sharing the gospel is concerned how what should be our 
approach. So, you know, if you could read it once again, uh, chapter 4, uh, verses 5 and 6, please. Chapter 4, 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Yeah, we are surrounded by people who do not know Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, uh, we go to our workplace. There are so many people over there who do not know Christ. We come back home to our uh, to our uh, to our locality. Or there are so many of the families over there do not know Christ. They are like literally surrounded by people uh, you know, who are called outsiders over here because they have not yet come into the fold of Jesus Christ. So they're still outsiders. And there are so many opportunities, divine opportunities, where we can reach out to them. It's just that we need to be aware, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why it says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Now, that's the way NIV puts it. It says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. The way you act towards them, the, the words that you use when you're speaking to them, the whole attitude of you know, helpfulness and kindness that you show when you're you know, interacting with them, that really makes a great difference. They start looking at you and they think, oh my, this person is not living the earth life, you know, the life to which everyone else is like chained. This person is living differently and yet they are succeeding in life. What is so different about them? So they sit up and take notice because you're being wise in the way you are acting towards the others. You're being very careful in your speech with them. You're being very, very loving in your, you know, whole um, conduct towards them. And they think, oh, okay, this person has got something different. And let me find out what it is. So you're redeeming the time. You're making use of every opportunity that you're getting to show them that, you know what, I've got my life is hidden in somebody. And you also can have the same kind of life. So we, we make you, we are very, very wise and careful in our interactions with people. Let your conversation be always full of grace. There are going to be people who will be hostile towards what you are saying. They will say very negative things about Jesus Christ and about Christians and about Christianity. And your conversation should be full of grace when you are addressing such people so that they realize, oh, there is something more uh, you know, than what I thought. They have all these hostile, negative thoughts about Christ, about Christians. But then when you start speaking full of grace, they begin to realize, oh, there's something more to it. So maybe I was actually wrong in, in the impression that I had about this Jesus, about this Christian life. And you are seasoned with salt in your speech. So their life is so meaningless. It's so bland. They are tied down. They, don't, they do not know a better way of life. And you are bringing flavor into their lives by talking to them about Christ and what Christ can do. You know, it literally adds flavor to their meaningless, bland existence. So your conversation, when you when you when, when you're speaking, you know, with the anointing of Christ, you're literally bringing flavor into their meaningless lives. You're doing, you're making such a great difference. So you will be able to answer to everyone, you know, depending on what situation it is and what they are bringing up with you. If it's a person in need, they will experience Christ's love through you. If they are having questions, those questions will get answered by Jesus Christ through you. It's always Christ who will do it. It's just being done through you because you are a willing and cooperative vessel who is um, who is open to the to the Lord's leading. So he's able to guide you and help you in, in, in giving that person whatever they require in their situation. So you're being wise in your interactions with people. Um, as usual, we are <laughs> left with just five minutes, uh, but it's okay in the sense because verse seven onwards, it's you no, know, it's all about uh, you know Paul talking about the people with whom he works, and you know he he say he gives he sends greetings from them and all of that. So he talks about Tychicus, and um, um, he says that I'm sending Tychicus specifically for one purpose. That's in verse eight. He says. 
uh, I'm sending him so that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. Because these uh, people in Colosse, you know, they don't have any phone. Um, they don't have any, you know, um, email, nothing. So they have no idea what's going on with Paul and they are really worried and concerned. They only know that he's been arrested, he's imprisoned over there. They don't know whether any death sentence has been given or what's going on. So he says, you know, I'm sending back Tychicus just so that you don't have to go on worrying about me. He will come to you. He will encourage you and tell you that things are going well for me over here, that, you know, things are all right. And in fact, I may not even get a death sentence. So, you know, in fact, he was released right after that. Uh, after the first imprisonment, he was, in fact, released. Uh, so things actually worked out well. So Paul is so concerned. He's sending someone away from him, not holding on to Tychicus, but sending him back to these people so that Tychicus can come to them and put their minds at rest and encourage them and tell them that things are okay, things are going well. Really beautiful, you know, this whole attitude, this heart which Paul had. Um, and then he talks about his fellow prisoner, Aristarchus. Aristarchus is the, is the person who had gone along with Paul on his uh, third missionary journey. And um, when they were in uh, Ephesus, uh, you know, Aristarchus gets arrested um, along with Paul. Uh, it talks, we, we get to know about that in, in Acts chapter 19 verses 28 to 29 where this whole crowd comes you know and they're really angry about how ephesus is um ephesus pagan traditions are you know kind of getting uh, Okay, so yeah, we just have literally two minutes left. Uh, so Aristarchus is the person who, uh, you know, uh, stood with Paul, uh, was persecuted along with Paul. Uh, so he's gone through, you know, a lot for the gospel. And now we get to know that he's a fellow prisoner. So along with Paul, he too has been arrested and he too is standing on trial. Uh, and uh, so we get to know that. And we also get to know that now peace has been made with Mark because he's mentioned over here. It says, you know, the greetings are being sent by Mark as well. And he says, if uh, Paul says, if, if Mark comes to you, you know, welcome him. So we get to know that now Mark is no longer uh, backslidden uh, in the sense that in, during the first missionary journey, you know, he abandons Paul and he leaves and goes away because life is too tough. It's too hard. And so he goes away. But Barnabas kind of, you know, goes after him and mentors him. And now Mark is now once again strong in the faith. Uh, and so um, so that's why Ma Paul says over here, you know, if he comes to you, people in Colosse, welcome him. You know, welcome him and accept him as a leader. So um, we see that Paul gives this person a second chance. And because he gave him a second chance, in fact, we have the Gospel of Mark today. You know, because he went on to become this amazing, strong believer. And he, in fact, wrote the Gospel of Mark for us. So um, Paul, just like Jesus, he gives people second chances. Uh, even though they have made a mistake, you know, um, he is, gives them a second chance to, um, you know, um, to once again establish themselves in God and once again grow strong in God. Uh, so we have all of these greetings and there are a whole bunch of other names mentioned. Um, but of course, we don't have time to look at them, but it's all right. Uh, so uh, let's just, you know, close with a word of prayer. Yeah. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the things that you spoke to us from your scriptures today. We pray, oh Lord, that uh, all of these we will apply to our lives so that they become 
practical realities. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be like the person that James talked about, that we will continue to intently look into the mirror of God's word. We will continue to see who we are and the new status that we have in you. And Lord, we will continue to walk in that so that everything that we do will be blessed. We will have a blessed life in you, through you. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to, uh, to walk in these things and apply them on a daily basis to our lives. You enable us and you anoint us for this, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll meet again next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.